Welcome into episode 189 of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. I'm Nicholas Raba. And I'm Nicholas Tachek. Wow, I haven't heard that in a while. Getting the band back together, I think one of you said a minute ago. Hey, uh, WWDC 20, the big virtual developer event, is happening this week. Got news for iPhone, got news for iPad. Uh, We're not doing that this week. This week, we are hitting highlights for the Mac, including one feature that is hot off the virtual presses. Hear it all on this edition of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. So it's kind of hard to know how to hit uh, what we're hitting today because Apple covered a ton of stuff on Monday and more stuff keeps coming. Uh, Monday's keynote was one hour and 49 minutes long, which is about the same as recent WWDC keynotes. Though, as I pointed out on Mac OS Ken earlier this week, uh, there were no pauses for applause. So that's like 15 minutes right there. Uh, Demos didn't take as long as usual. Moving from topic to topic and speaker to speaker was super fast. I say all of that to say it felt like there was a lot more jammed into Monday's uh, one hour and 49 minutes than usual. Now, like I said in the intro, we're not going to hit all of it today, but being privacy and security minded folks, uh, we will lean into some of those features. And, you know, since this show is brought to you by Secure Mac, uh, we'll lead off with the Mac. Mac OS 11, this one is called, walking away from the OS 10 numbering after nearly 20 years of that. Big Sur is the California attraction Apple has chosen for this one. In its press release, the Cupertino company says it is the biggest design upgrade since the introduction of Mac OS X. Uh, They also brag in the release about the faster, more personal, privacy-first Safari experience. And uh, since they say it's privacy-first, we'll go there first. Apple says the new Safari will be able to match or exceed Chrome's speed with frequently visited sites loading up to 50% faster on Safari. Now, what's funny is it's weird to get, you know, two paragraphs, I think, into a press release and say, well, that feels like it could be a security thing. Because when I heard that, I immediately uh, thought about the pre-caching that led to Heartbleed. I believe it was uh, Heartbleed that that was um, tied up with. Do we know how Apple is accounting for Safari's newfound speed? Uh, no, we don't know yet, and we're probably not going to know till uh, people have a chance to kind of dig into it more. Um, your your idea about pre-caching, that makes sense. I mean, the way you speed up website loading is generally cache as much stuff as you can for frequently visited websites. Uh, that way it doesn't have to re-download it from the website next time you visit if it hasn't changed. Uh, as far as the difference between that and Heartbleed goes, uh, Heartbleed was a hardware vul- vulnerability. So, yes, in the sense that they're kind of a similar idea, but I I don't think that software is going to be. Now you're going to have researchers going, wait, it is downloading all this data. How can we uh, interject it with? with some sort of malicious data like how can we execute something on a person's computer by hacking a web page and you know popular websites it's going to pre download stuff i don't think that has anything <laughs> to do with their with their engine though i i don't think that um I, I mean the other thing with heartbleed is that the 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 sensitive data that was being stored in memory like passwords and stuff like that um it, you know, we're talking about hardware there and and the data has to kind of go through there at some point either way. Um, software, also you can patch hardware. You know, they patch stuff, but it slowed down the hardware. I, I, so I guess um, we, we don't know how they're accounting for the speed. Yes, it probably has something to do with, with caching of some sort, but I wouldn't be concerned at all uh, that it were something like Heartbleed because that's, I, I think that comparison doesn't doesn't hold up. Yeah, you see, I was going to say, honestly, I think it's probably doing this show that just makes me, like, I read everything and go, okay, well, wait a minute, hold on a second. Because probably what this actually is, is somebody at Apple going, ooh, say it's twice as fast as Chrome. 
I mean, that's really what it is, right? It's not that they're saying, oh, so the 50 sites that you go to most, we're going to keep copies of that, and so it's going to load 50% faster. I think what they're saying is if you took, you know, machine A, which is Windows-based, you know, running whatever browser they're running, and you take Windows uh, uh, machine B, which is the Mac, you know, running our latest software, we're always going to be faster. Like, if you've never heard of this URL before, if you type them both in the, you know, the mm -hmm. same machine or the two machines at the same time, uh, the Apple machine is going to be faster. It's, I'm overthinking it is what I'm saying. I'm probably oh, overthinking gotcha. it. See, and I, I thought you meant See, you were thinking about things with a security perspective, which is a good thing to have. Well, um, I was, but I think, you know, like... He is. Like, He's trying to say we've made him paranoid. But no, that's a good thing. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good thing because it means you're, you're, you're kind of looking at that and you're looking at the... Um, you know, security and privacy aspect is as one of your primary concerns when you're looking at new features, and that's a good thing, <laughs> and it's something that more users should have. No, I'm serious. No, I know because I... Uh, so many times we give away uh, our privacy and our security in, in the name of new technology. Right, and everybody knows that security and privacy are generally uh, an afterthought, if at all, uh, for most companies. So as for the privacy parts of Safari. Uh, you know, not not the stuff that I'm making up for us, but the stuff that Apple actually talked about. Uh, there were a couple of things highlighted there. Um, two things that I wanted to focus on. There's the new privacy report that comes in Safari, and then there's also control over extensions. Uh, Mr. Tadchak, uh, why don't you tell us about the, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Raba. I, I get us confused. <laughs> Can you tell me, uh, Nick, about the uh, about the privacy report side? Yeah, the privacy report feature is pretty cool just for the way that they showcase the data, what your website is actually doing. And back in the day, if you wanted to know uh, what cookies were loaded on your computer, um, you would look at the source code of the page. Um, later on, you would look at what cookies were stored um, on your computer through the preference panel for whatever browser you were using. Now they're putting it more in front of the user. Um, so you're able to just click an icon and you'll be able to see uh, the domain names of, of the different cookies, uh, the trackers, the websites, the different components um, of the website that's reaching out to neighboring type websites, which is really cool to see. And It'll it'll make you understand a little bit more about how much of this data is actually going to these ad companies. And you're probably going to wonder why all this data is going to so many different companies. Hmm. I know we haven't seen the reports yet unless you guys are running the beta. Um we didn't hear anything <laughs> we didn't hear anything during this WWDC about who got Sherlocked. Hearing you talk about that, it made me wonder, because I also haven't used Little Snitch, but I mean, is this like big enough that it's going to actually start eating into other third party things that sort of bring back that information or sort of stand there uh, to guard against? Or am I, again, making up too much stuff and going too far? No, you're 100 percent spot on there. Um, it's the, the functionality is actually something that a lot of developers had asked for over the years, uh, developers who are doing Safari content blockers. Um, there's not an easy way for developers to be able to say, like, we blocked this many trackers going to this site because the way Safari content blocking works is it, it doesn't give the developer that information as a way to keep things private. I mean, it makes sense. The downside there is that Apple has some capabilities beyond what they're giving third party developers. So in this case, their, their product is going to be probably one of the best in class as far as that goes, because they have access, at least on iOS, to, to being able to do things uh, that you couldn't easily uh, you couldn't do as easily. I know there are products for iOS right now that are more of the VPN firewall type that can track uh, or that can show you what's tracking you uh, down to domain names. But as far as a native built in uh, app where you're not rerouting your 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 browsing data through a VPN or anything like that, I think this is uh, I'm pretty sure this is unique on iOS that they this is information that um, without kind of rerunning your own networking stack, you couldn't do as a third party developer. So. I'm assuming they're going to be doing something similar on the Mac. Uh, so yeah, they're going to be um, for the security side of things. They're they're probably going to be taking a bite out of some 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 companies with that. 
But we've seen browsers like Firefox, um, mm -hmm. their little shield icon next to the URL. Um, it, it's kind of, I think it's kind of the equivalent of what's being added into Safari as well. Um, you're able to see your social media trackers. You're able to click on the tracking content and you're able to see the, the different ad companies. So Firefox looks like they've broken it down on that level as well. But is uh, Firefox blocking them by default? That's what Apple's going to be doing is they're going to be stopping the stuff by default. Not just telling you, know, you that it's on your system. It's going to prevent it from sending data to it. You know, I believe in the settings you're able to uh, set up your levels of restrictions in Firefox. So um, um, when I, uh, for instance, I'm on CNET's website in Firefox right now, and I clicked on the, on the Shield icon, and it says Enhanced Tracking Protection is on for this site. It kind of shows you your protection settings. Right now I have mine at strict. And if you click on it, you're able to uh, break down to go to standard, custom, like from that level. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of it's kind of cool from that. And that was one of my favorite things about Firefox um, was how they brought that into the forefront as well. So it's cool to see Safari, and the browser that everybody's using, have that in front of people's faces as well. Can we go ahead and talk about the extension controls as well? Uh, from what I can tell, it looks almost like it's going to be sandboxing for extensions, uh, but user user controllable in that now we'll be able to import a bunch of extensions that were on other browsers. Uh, they, they kind of made it easier for developers to support their extensions, which means there'll be a lot of new extensions for Safari, which means they need uh, some security because on the Windows side of things, bad browser extensions are actually uh, a really common way to get a bunch of junk on your computer you don't want. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't really think about it, but a lot of times when we're, when we're installing a browser extension, we're giving it access to a lot of data in our web browser that if you stop and think for a second, they wouldn't actually need. There's some browser extensions that will get like your entire browsing history or uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. There's capabilities that developers can ask for on the win on uh, like Chrome, for example. Um, and so I think Apple's acutely aware of that. And, and what they're doing is they're making it so a user can specify that a certain browser extension will only work with a, a specific website. So it will basically limit that browser uh, extension to only being enabled when you're on that domain name. It's just not going to be running in the background all the time grabbing your data. So some malicious site won't be able to exploit a vulnerability found in that extension. Exactly. Only if, only if you say uh, uh, securemac.com is the only website able to run this extension. It's not going to be interfacing with it at all. Okay, can you give me an idea, though? Yeah, that's why, awesome. Like, how is it that you would... The only extension that I use is one for my password manager. And obviously, I want that to work on every site that I go to because if I'm going to be logging in, it's going to say, okay, well, how do we get in again? And it's going to tell them, and it's, you know, that's great. I'm trying to figure out a situation where I would have, like, go to the trouble of installing an extension but have it only work for one site. Do you know what I mean? That's... I, I understand exactly what you mean there. And it was actually something I was thinking about myself with this is that I don't really use too many extensions. Um, I actually don't know. I mean, I know people use them. Mm -hmm. I don't know people who use a lot of them personally, if any. I, I mainly know people who use them for the password managers. Uh, personally, I've always found browser extensions, at least since apps became well, a what thing, a, to, to be what kind about of ones like Grammarly. That, and that's what I was just thinking is Grammarly would be a good example of one I would want to limit. Um, my limit the site access to maybe in that case i would limit grammarly to only working if i'm on um my college homework website where i'm I'm typing up an essay or something like that uh because that's one of those extensions that has access to a lot of your browsing data that it it you know they say they need it so they can correct your spelling and grammar and all that stuff um everybody tries to get as much data as they can these days uh because data is valuable commodity online and, and we don't think about that a lot in terms of our privacy. So I, I think anything that can that can limit the amount of data that we're giving freely away to other places without even knowing about it is a good thing. So we might think about it instead of, okay, I just want you to work with this one site, you might go the other way and say, you have no business working on my banking site, so I'm going to eliminate mm -hmm. that one. Or you have no business on my, you know, 
I don't know, my doctor's site. So I'm going to eliminate that one as well. What I would do instead would be, uh, instead of only picking the sites that, that you that you don't want it to work with, because I, I, for me, there would be a lot of sites I don't want a browser extension to work with. There'd be very few sites I would want it to work with. But that, that reflects my use of the web browser by not using many extensions day to day as it is. Uh, I would personally probably go with the other route, which is, I think, what Apple did, which was allow choose what sites you want to allow it on and, and not anything else. Because for me, it's, it would be way easier to pick a, a small number of websites that I'd want Grammarly to have access to than it would be to, to pick all the websites I don't want them to have access to. Okay. If that makes sense. Now, something I hadn't noticed, though, again, it is mentioned in Apple's uh, Big Sur press release. Uh, the company says, inspired by the convenience and readability of food nutrition labels, uh, new privacy information detailed on the Mac App Store will help users understand the privacy practices of apps before downloading them, including the types of data the apps might collect, such as usage, contact information, or location, and whether that data is shared with uh, third parties for tracking. It's like the nutritional information on the side of uh, cereal boxes. There was nothing like that when we were kids because, you know, you needed more room for the cartoon mascot. But now it's pretty easy to read. On the one hand, I say, yay, you know, Apple's letting us know about this stuff. On the other hand, I, I don't know. Shouldn't they be letting the user control whether the apps have that information or warning the user that the apps will be getting that information? Kind of like what we were just talking about, about extensions. We can say yay or nay on certain things, but there are going to be apps that even if all my friends are using it, the nutritional information is going to say, well, it's going to take all your data. I mean, is is just warning us that that's what's happening. Uh, Apple's way of, of giving the user that control or or is there no way to be more meticulous? Kind of like a, a pre-disclosure, I guess. Um, mm. Like, as a developer, you're requesting permission to access certain activities on the computer. So if you want to save a file to to a user's directory or access the camera, or uh, there's certain things now that you see the notifications for and you have to approve for it to happen. So if you're planning on using those functionalities um, as key components to your application itself. It kind of puts it out there in the open, definitely. But I think if a user wants an app or it's the latest, greatest app or whatever the case is, people are still going <laughs> to click on it. It's not really going to deter people from doing it. And just like the end user license agreements, um, there should be more reading of those going on, but so many people just proceed, 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 click, 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 sign, yeah. sign, sign, without doing much of the homework. I, I think, at least on the Android side of things, they've always had more granular privacy controls, and that's something I'd really, I think we're starting to see Apple move that route, especially with these uh, nutrition labels. And it's something I think I'd like to see continue more. Right now, they kind of give us some really basic controls, like, do I want to let this access my pictures? Do I want to let this access my microphone? And, and the Apple had, they added, uh, you know, the only while using this app in iOS 13, which is really, really great. Uh, I would still like to see it kind of extended further where we'd have more control um, because you know, we, we see time and again that that developers are going to um, abuse the position, their position of trust and, and get data from their users and whether or not the user knows that's happening. Um, I think the control should be in place that, that if they don't want that happening, they should have the option there. I, I forget which article it was. Um, I think we were posting it on our uh, chats or one of the links went by, but it was talking about how one of the applications uh, even though you don't give it your geolocation, but you give it permission to access your photos. And then by having access to your photos, it is able to get oh. your geolocation by your by the data stored within the photos. It, it, there's Yeah, that's smart. <laughs> people are thinking of ways. So even if you say, no, I'm not going to share my, my, uh, my location with you, uh, but you want to upload this picture now I need access to this and now I have this data if most of your pictures are taken in a certain area well 
then chances are you're in that area. I wonder if there's, I mean, that's got to be a thing that's coming at some point, right? That Apple will just by default let you strip that information out before you share it anywhere. Because I know I'm not conscious of how much information is being shared with every single photo. I mean, they're... they're... I want to say that some EXIF data is is stripped automatically, maybe. In one of the recent versions of iOS, when you go to share a picture... Yeah, um, that's right. Location. Data. There's an option at the top that that you could click on, and then you could uh, slide that bar over um, to say "Don't include location data," which which does nothing if you're standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> yeah. I'm at Disneyland, but I don't want anybody to know where. Hey, uh, if you're wondering, by the way, whether your Mac will run uh, Big Sur, there's a piece from Apple Insider that lists machines out there uh, that we know will run it. Uh, those include the MacBook 2015 or later, MacBook Air 2013 or later, MacBook Pro 2013 and later, Mac Mini 2014 and later, iMac 2014 and later, every model of the iMac Pro, and uh, the Mac Pro 2013 and later. Even if you were paying no attention to WWDC this week, you have to have heard about the biggest change for the Mac, because uh, it was on all the newses, it seems. Uh, The biggest change for the Mac line isn't the new operating system, but the whole new Mac architecture. As had been speculated for years and rumored for months, Apple has announced the move from x86 Intel processors to ARM-based processors designed by Apple itself. Apple Silicon, the company calls it. The new hardware will be based on the same ARM processor architecture already used in the A-series chips that power iPhones and iPads, and I I guess the iPod Touch, if that's still a thing. Apple says that the move will result in vastly improved performance and efficiency, as well as a unified hardware ecosystem that will make it easier for software developers to optimize apps across devices. Uh, This raised a few questions for me. Let me throw them out there, and uh, then we can tear them apart. Are ARM-based processors inherently safer was the first question I had. Uh, Will we still need malware protection on ARM-based Macs was the second question. And then for you guys specifically, how drastic is the change uh, in what you do moving from one architecture to another? Well, I'd say for whether or not they're inherently safer or not, that's that's not really going to be something we're going to be able to determine until people get their hands on the chips. They're not under NDAs. They can take them through their paces. But... Hardware, um, hardware security at that level is something that people will take a look at. So we'll find out. Um, but I can't picture Apple doing anything that would be moving their platforms to something that was inherently unsafer than what they currently have. Right. So, so I think it would be at least the same. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, part of the reason that the that the question occurred to me is because. I look at my iPhone as a vault. I look at my iPhone as something that is that is much safer than the Mac. Now, maybe I'm misguided in that or delusional in that, but I think about it in those terms, and I and, and in my head, I'm like, oh, well, it's got an ARM processor, so that must be part of it. Uh, what really, though, it's probably, that probably has more to do with the, the level of control that Apple exercises over iOS, uh, a level of control that it hasn't exercised to this point over the Mac OS, just because... That's not how we we think about or use our computers. I mean, that's the reason that, you know, you guys and and everybody else says, well, not everybody, the jailbreak community is a community for a reason. But security people say, hey, listen, don't jailbreak because the protections are not necessarily baked into the hardware. Certainly there are some, like you've got, you know, the secure enclave and things like that. But the real protections for iOS are baked into iOS. I I think that... The sandboxing is probably what helps with the the iOS device more than anything. Keeping that safe is keeping processes away from each other. Mm-hmm. And it's much harder to do on the Mac uh, because sandboxing isn't the foundation it was built upon. Kind of mm-hmm. like iOS is I mean, it's built to be sandboxed. And, and the Mac is kind of going that way and it has been for years, but it's not there yet. Um, as far as the question about needing malware protection goes, um, there's not as much, but there's malware for iOS uh, and there's malware for Macs. There's not going to be anything that says that there's not going to be uh, malware for the ARM-based Macs. Uh, depending on what Apple does for security stuff, there might be less. You know, if they're if they're going to crack down on some of the, and I know they are, they're they're cracking down some of the ways that that the bad guys have used to to hide stuff in the system. 
Um, but at the same time, there's I think we're always going to see malware on the platform, at least as long as uh, I don't think it's going to slow anybody down. Yeah, it's, it's not. And and so I, I, I think at most we might see some malware authors have to release a new version of their malware. But even then, I don't I don't think it's going to it's not going to make it um, a, a difference in, in that regard, I don't think. Yeah, it'll I mean, be universal. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, I mean, that's the thing, at least for the next several years. And if we if we shift from what we know today to, you know, putting on our science fiction hat or, you know, putting on the, oh, this is what Apple's always been trying to do. I mean, you'll always hear people say that what Apple wants is a day where you can't get software that runs on the Mac except from the Mac App Store. I mean, at that point, you might actually stamp it down. But I mean, first of all, I don't know that, that that Apple would ever do that because they can't make all the software for every set, everything. And the other thing is, at least for the next several years, they're committed to, yeah, we're going to keep running the software that you can run on your Intel base Macs now. We're going to be making Intel base Macs for at least another couple of years, and then we're committed to supporting that for years after. Well, then, I mean, that, that still leaves a ton of doors open for bad guys, which, of course, uh, creates or, or maintains a need for, uh, for anti-malware software as well. There's one one concern I would have, and this is kind of a years years out there concern. Mm-hmm. When we saw the transition from from PPC to Intel, and this kind of ties into the third question about how drastic change is going to be for us. Um, it was, I remember it being a major change at the time, but it wasn't um, it wasn't end of the world for us because kind of dove in and just did what we had to for transitioning our programs. And mm-hmm. I expect that it's going to be the same way this time around with with how big it changes. However. What you had with the transition from PPC to Intel is that the universal binaries ran for a number of years. They'd run on both platforms, both both types of processors. And eventually Apple dropped support for PPCs and only released Mac OS for Intel machines. Well, there were still some users who kept using their PPC machines because they had software that couldn't run on the new hardware. So if that's a case going forward, that could be a potential security issue years down the line where if we have something that only runs on Intel-based Macs and isn't ported to ARM and somebody desperately needs to use it for their business, what happens years down the line when Apple stops supporting uh, Intel Macs, when they stop getting security updates? When they start, they're, they're, I've, but that's been something that's plagued exactly. us for... But, and that's, for, that's what I'm saying is... As long that, as we can remember. And, and that, but that's what I'm saying is there will be a certain point where um, Intel Macs are no longer the, the primary focus and the, the transition period, there will be ARM Macs and Intel Macs on the playing field at the same time. And there will be equal, well, maybe not equal, but there'll be, there'll be attention being paid to both of them for security stuff. Eventually, the Intel platform uh, on Mac or on, for Apple side of things will not be supported anymore as a platform. And that would be where I would see uh, concerns for potential, I guess, malware issues in the future would be uh, th- those people who get left behind, who right. need to run an older hardware and can't upgrade for whatever reason. What are, what are we going to do there for security stuff? Um, and I think that's going to be dependent upon how many years, you know, Apple says it's going to take a couple of years to transition. So uh, how many years will they support Intel-based Macs beyond the official switchover? That'll be the big question. You got to figure it's going to be a long time, though. I mean, because Tim Cook actually said during the WWDC keynote that they actually have Intel Macs in the pipeline that they're excited about, which I literally said out loud, why would anybody buy them? Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then, uh, chatting quickly with Ben Beharan from Creative Strategies on Twitter, um, uh, he quickly led me to the it's for the enterprise. So you know they're going to have to support it for a while because if Apple is making Macs that they're thinking companies are going to be buying in the hundreds or the thousands, I don't think you can you know in two years and one day be like, hey, have you heard about the ARM based Macs? Uh, speaking of which, the first ARM-based Macs are expected to hit stores by the end of 2020 with the transition for the entire Mac line expected to take a couple of years. Just like we were talking about, Apple says they will continue to release new versions of Mac OS uh, that work on Intel-based Macs for many years to come, and they've got the Macs in the pipeline, like I said. I'm curious about your individual levels of excitement. This is not, you know... Well, I get first as developers, but then just as, you know, guys who get a new computer at some point, uh, excited, not excited, scale of one to 10. Uh, 11. Really? Yeah. No, we no, like no, new totally hardware. Uh, well, no, it's, it's not that at all, actually. Um, well, <laughs> Wait, for, at first all, all, it's not for, that at no, all. For, there's a couple things. A couple things. Uh, Intel, Intel has been lagging in recent years to deliver for 
for the Mac chipsets. They just haven't been competitive with with the rest of the industry, and they've been expensive, and that's been a problem. Um, so that's if this can address it, and, and we know Apple makes great chips. We we absolutely know that from their from their iOS line of devices. Uh, additionally, what I see this doing is is unifying their their processor architecture across their platforms, um, which, which I, I I guess the route that I see that going is eventually Apple's going to be doing their own VR AR headset, and this type of processor is going to be the type of processor you'd want the type of platform you'd want for something like that for mobile uh, devices that don't use so much power and and get good battery life. And it's going to be where we're going to see the computer industry going. So yes, I'm very excited because that means that this is um, you know, something that Apple is, is doing with a, a thought to the future. We'll look at the keynote itself in a moment. Well, actually, and the late-breaking security thing, too. First, though, a word about MacScan 3 from Secure Mac. For me, the Mac is perfect. Of course, it's not a perfect machine. There's no such thing. I mean, we used to think that Macs were immune to malware. Well, that was never true, malware for the Mac is more prevalent and more dangerous today than it's ever been before. You can guard against that with MacScan 3. MacScan 3 is a great defense against malicious software attacks aimed at your Mac. It's developed by Secure Mac, trusted names in computer security and developers of exceptional security software for over 20 years. MacScan 3 detects and removes Mac malware, catches keyloggers, removes tracking cookies, and provides full-range or targeted scanning, all without crowding up your hard drive or slowing down your machine. Sign up for a free 30-day trial today at securemac.com slash macscan, then once you decide to buy, buy it for less. You can take a little off your subscription to MacScan 3 with offer code CHECKLIST. Try it first, let it find and remove the bad stuff that you've bumped into. Then when you're ready to buy, buy for less with offer code CHECKLIST at securemac.com slash MacScan. Yeah, I talk about that every now and then. Um, Market Watch. Market Watch, the website Market Watch, and I'll call them out because it makes me mad. Every time I go to Market Watch, at night when MacScan 3 runs for me, uh, usually about 10 tracking cookies from Market Watch. Thank you, I guess is what I'm saying. I, I, I'm not only a uh, not only a person on the show, I'm also a person who uses the uh, uses the product and really appreciate it. All right, so here's a question. If you well, not really a question. It's rhetorical. How quickly is all of this changing? Is the rhetorical question. Uh, right before we started recording, less than 30 minutes before we were supposed to record, a story hit Cult of Mac that said, get ready to log into websites with Face ID or Touch ID. According to the report, Safari users uh, soon will be able to securely log into websites using Face ID and Touch ID. The new feature, which Apple is rolling out in iOS 14, iPadOS 14, and macOS Big Sur, should take away one of the most irritating things about using the web remembering and then typing in usernames and complicated passwords. On websites that support the feature, users can opt in to use Apple's biometric ID systems, making that irritating login dance a thing of the past. Well, that part makes me sad because my login dance is pretty sexy. I know we have barely had time to look at this, um, but what are some of your immediate thoughts, guys? That would be awesome. Um, They've already removed a lot of friction with iCloud Keychain mm-hmm. um, and, and autofilling passwords and stuff like that. But I mean, if if we could switch this to to Face ID and and not like not have to do anything, that'd be that'd be really cool. Uh, my concern there would be I, I would assume that the websites would still have a, a username and password backing up the Face ID thing in case you you know your your face changes or something. Um, but my concern there would be uh, kind of something we talked about a long time ago, but uh, with our digital legacies episode, uh, making sure that no matter how they do it, I'm assuming it's just going to be an Apple, uh, you know, a face ID slapped on top of a traditional login thing. Uh, eventually, I would like to see the traditional login go away, but see, we're yeah. going to have to make sure that this is done properly. 
I was thinking about it, like even the login with Facebook, login with all these other, all these other things, it kind of gets rid of the password aspect. So my takeaway of it is it would be some sort of token Mm -hmm. where Apple is, is basically that middle person right there. Um, So when you log in with your face ID, after you create your account, you don't have those passwords. See, what I find interesting is one of the things that we've talked about a lot on this show, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's forcing, you know, two-factor or multi-factor authentication, but it's kind of just, you know, lending 2FA mm-hmm. or, or MFA in front of you. It's taking the step out of the middle. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's making yeah. it seamless. Uh, Nick, I would say one the concern I have there with, um, with the token thing, and I, I, I hear you, um, is that, uh, again, this is a specific specific case, but it would be like, with um when my father passed away and i had to get into some of his his accounts if it was a face id or touch id type thing i would have been sol um luckily he had written his passwords down and so i was able to get into his accounts and close them out and all that stuff uh but you know that that looking forward yes i think passwords as we know them eventually have to go because the system is just it's, it's ludicrous uh we still need security though so if we're going to switch to something like Face ID or Touch ID and and eventually take away, because that's probably where this is all going, uh, eventually taking away that that uh, having to type stuff in part, we just need to make sure that there's a mechanism in place for account recovery, account security, all those typical exactly. things we think of that we normally use passwords for right now, you know, the backup stuff. So as long as that's I, I, being thought of, I think it's cool. I think there's still going to have to be that uh, main login password. So, mm-hmm. like, even though you, with Face ID and Touch ID, um, if you do it incorrectly X amount of times, it's like, well, now enter your password. And um, I'm not going to say that my kids know my password, but I have a whole bunch of new apps on my phone thanks to my kid. And I go, why is this app on here? And my son goes, oh, I was playing this game and then I saw a commercial for this other game, so I clicked install. Well, uh, how do you install? I put in your password. You're going to end up with $15,000 <laughs> worth of Smurf berries, dude. You're going to end up with like $15,000 yeah. worth of gems that, that won't, by the way, be real gems, and they don't actually exchange for $15,000. Uh, let's get back to the uh, to the keynote itself. I have to admit, as I watched the keynote, uh, I hadn't been awake for maybe as long as I should have been. Um I've said a few times now, though, really, I was just overwhelmed by all of the information being thrown out there in a fairly short time. That said, it felt to me at the time like there was less of a focus on privacy and security during the keynote than I had expected. Although, I uh, talked to Today and iOS host Rob Walsh the other day, and he watches these things like the Zapruder film. So he says that they actually got a full five minutes on privacy from 55 minutes in to right at the top of the hour. And that other big features, you know, only got like seven minutes or in some cases, four minutes. I think, uh, you know, well, obviously the move to the ARM processors got the most. Being security guys, and I guess maybe because I do this show, so I'm always watching with a tiny bit of an eye for that. Uh, did you feel like there was enough emphasis on privacy and security or is the thinking, well, it's developers and they know about the privacy security thing. So we're not going to bother, you know, during the keynote, we'll talk to them for the next four days. I think that, it had a decent amount, actually. It, it, yeah, I was going to say, it had a decent amount, especially compared to, uh, you know, or especially in, in light of the ARM announcement. Um, I, I think, yeah, I, I think I think for the most part, the security talks are always later in the week anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, you really only put up your uh, your main features with, um, with what, what you can do in the keynote. So privacy and security are always going to play second fiddle to the main features. Um But I think at this point, Apple, I think it's intentional, but I think Apple is almost positioning themselves to be uh, opposite of Google in terms of the security and privacy stance. Google is the company that's known for taking all your information. Mm -hmm. They they want to know everything about you. And Apple is like, we don't want to know anything about you. We're all about privacy. And this move with Safari uh, tracking, blocking stuff that they're that they're really going to be cracking down on. I mean, that's. That's taken a, a direct swipe at Google's revenue model or one of their revenue models with with ad revenue. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that um, even if they didn't 
maybe put that many minutes into it at the keynote, the content of what they did announce is big enough that, uh, yeah, I'm happy with their announcements. Okay, so that is uh, that's the Mac covered. Well, that's starting to cover the Mac. Although, as we mentioned, as we record this, WWDC is still going on, so uh, th- there's still time for plenty more things. In the meantime, if you're looking for more security news and how tos, the place to look is securemac.com/checklist. There you'll find notes for this show. Oh, I feel sorry for, for Nick. It's going to be a tough one. But there you will find notes for this show, uh, for the last show, for all the shows we've done, all the way back to the first one. And you can actually listen to every show right there as well. So you can almost read along with uh, what you're hearing at securemac.com slash checklist. If you have a question you would like to ask or a topic you would like to hear us hit... Our email address is checklist at securemac.com. The address again is checklist at securemac.com. And if you can't remember that, please do remember this. You're listening to The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week. Next week.